Good morning. I'm being shown money again. I love it when people flash money at me. Uh, I guess that means that we haven't taken collection. So can I ask the stewards to wait on us for the collection, please? And while they're doing that, just to remind those who, who are uh, watching the services online that on the 17th there will be no online service, um, simply because we, we, can't, we can't have the children and all the various people up and that we put them online. So if you are watching online and you were expecting a service on the 17th, there won't be a service on the 17th. And as, as they are, are collecting that, I'm going to bend down and get hold of my computer. Um, we're going to start with communion this morning. Um, this morning I've, I've chosen to address some of the questions because it appears as though when we speak about manifestations of the Spirit, it's not something that we all grew up with. So we, we, we run into a problem of... Um, some of the stuff that is being said kind of hits a, a wall in our minds. So I, I just want to speak a little bit into that this morning. But before we do that, I believe that we need to come and we need to be able to say, Lord, we're here because we're born again and we're children of God. And as your children, we want to get everything, everything that you have for us. Why would we want less? Why would we want to think that we could be half saved? Think about that for a moment. Imagine you were only half saved. Um, we wouldn't want to be there because that would mean that we would never know whether we were saved or not. You know, wh why, why would we want to be um, sort of Christians? So this morning we're going to take communion. And, and I want to remind you that, that communion is a statement of what Jesus has done for us. This is why we, we come. You, you'll remember that Jesus on that night, he, he, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat this. This is my body which is broken for you. In other words, you're participating in me. And when we take communion this morning, um, we, we're coming and we're saying, I'm in Christ. If you're not in Christ, you're just eating bread. Actually, it's crackers. All right? All um, right. Then, then it actually means absolutely nothing. But if you're in Christ, if you're born again, and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, and, and, and when Jesus said, take this cup, this is the cup of the new covenant. It's a covenant for the forgiveness of the sins of, of the, a multitude. And then you're saying, it's my sins that have been covered on the cross. That's what you're saying with, with taking of the cup. You're actually taking the cup and saying, my sins have been forgiven. Thank you, Lord, that my sins have been forgiven. Which now means that I am a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm born again. And everything that the, the Bible promises me, everything that the Bible says about Christians, is my inheritance in Jesus Christ. Everything. Not some of the stuff, you know, it's not, um, I'll take this one, I won't take that one. Oh, I'll take this one, but I won't take that one. No, I get Holy Spirit who's God living inside of me. He lives inside of me. And, and we, we, when I, I participate, I'm reinforcing that fact that not only are my sins gone, not only am I in the body of Christ, but I'm reinforcing the fact that God, Holy Spirit, lives inside of me. So I'm going to ask the stewards to wait on you if they wouldn't come up and they would serve you. And, and I, I want you to take the, the, the cracker, the, the bread, and, and, and the, the, the cup. And I want you to sit with the Lord. And what you're doing this morning, this is between you and God. You, you're simply saying, Lord, I am your child. Because of what Jesus did on the cross. And Lord, I know my sins are gone. And then one more, and Lord, I know you live inside of me. And then you can take that and you can eat and drink when you're ready. You're not waiting for everybody else. This is personal.
We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of His mercy and love is at the feet of Jesus. We cry holy, holy, holy. We cry holy, holy, holy. And we cry holy, holy, holy. It's a land. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of His mercy and love is at the feet of Jesus. We cry, oh. Holy, holy, and we cry, holy, 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 we cry, holy, 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 it's the stewards a moment or two. And while they, they're eating and drinking, I want to remind you of the scripture that says, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And this morning as we, we come and we remind ourselves whoever does not love does not know God because God is love and this is how God showed us his love amongst us he sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him and father we want to thank you this morning that we can be in a space where we recognize that we have life we have life in you Holy Spirit and we want to honor you for that life but we want to honor you for the love that you've poured into our hearts, the love you've demonstrated to us, the love you've given to us, and even this incredible love that you, Holy Spirit, live inside of us. 
And we ask that this morning you lead and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. And thank you to the team behind me. You can just put your, your cups, I don't know what you normally do them, pass them to the aisle or something so that everybody's got one. Um, and, and as we go into this morning, what I, I want to remind you is if you took communion this morning, then this sermon is for you. Because Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Um, if you didn't take communion this morning for whatever reasons, um, you can sort those out with the Lord. Um, but if you have a different spirit living in you, well, then you can listen as well. All right. So this morning is, is, is about, we've looked at manifestations, and we've seen the manifestations of words of wisdom, words of knowledge, and healing. And there people have come and asked me questions in the last couple of weeks, which has exposed some gaps in our teaching. So uh, we, we can always sort things out. I'm, uh, and, and all I'm going to do this morning is, is to try and fill in some of the gaps. Because the questions that I, I get asked are repeated. So the first question that, that I've been asked of late is, um, why do I need spiritual gifts if I have spiritual fruit? Okay. Well, I'll answer it in a moment. Um, and, and really what, what, is, what is being asked here is, uh, for me is, how, how do gifts and fruit operate together in the same person? That would be me answering the question. Um, but for many of us, we never grew up with a, an understanding of the manifestations, the gifts of the Spirit. I come out of a theology, a, a very Reformed theology, where we were never taught manifestations in the church. The, and not, not because we, for any other reason than I think it was omitted. I don't think that, that anybody was trying to do anything untoward. Um, and so... When, when I hear these things for the first time, they kind of like ring in your ears because I've been a Christian for so many years, and why am I hearing this for the first time? Why is, why is this kind of like so new to me? Well, because the theology that most of us come out of, and I say most of us because most of us come out of either an English or an Afrikaans Reformed church, um, they... they teach without teaching that all of these things ceased when the last apostles died, all right? Um, that's kind of the base teaching. It's called cessationalism. Um, and, and I could give you the historical roots of that, but there's no need to do that because we have a Bible. We have a Bible, and when we want an answer, we go to the Bible. We don't go to men who died a thousand years ago or a hundred years ago and their opinion. We always go back to the Bible, and we say, well, what does the Bible have to say about these manifestations that we've been talking about? And in fact, this very letter to the Corinthians is an instruction on how Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus through the manifestations of the Spirit in the church. Now, the Corinthians were anything but apostles of Jesus. Come on, let's be real. Uh, if you've read through both the letters, you realize, and you know very quickly there were some serious problems in the church. But Paul sees manifestations in that church, and even though they have a misuse of those, he still sees them. He writes and he wants to instruct them. Now, listen to, listen to one of his instructions. He says, pursue love. Get the word, pursue love. Earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God. For one who though no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for the upbuilding, encouragement, and consolation of them. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. And so Paul, right in the beginning, he puts fruit, love, and gifts into the same sentence. You'll remember we did a whole series on love, and we, we, we said that, that love is, is probably um, the fruit of the Spirit. Love is manifested in joy, in peace, in patience, in kindness, in goodness, in faithfulness, and in self-control. But it's all love. 
It's agape. In other words, what Paul is saying, you can't say, I'm pursuing love, but not desiring gifts. It doesn't make any sense, does it? Not in that first sentence that I read to you. So what he's really saying is, you ought to be in a space where love and gifts operate together. And by the way, they're given in the, as a command. Um, th th this isn't just a, oh, it would be nice. No, he's saying, you pursue these things. You eagerly desire them. That's a command. So he, he, he's speaking to them to make some sort of action on their part. You have to go after these things. Many Christians will say things like this, very spiritually. If the Lord wanted to give me a gift of healing, he could do it sovereignly. Of course he could. He's God. But Paul comes and says, you ought to desire that. I mean, can you imagine? Uh, Barry, you're my son, all right? You're going to be my son, you know, my little boy. Okay. Barry's my son, and, and, and he make his favorite food. He said, Barry, here's your favorite food. And he says, oh, I don't know if I want that. If you put it in my mouth, I'll eat it. Huh? Get us fats. They wouldn't. <laughs> Not in today's world. But we go back a few years later and... and but hang on, this is his favorite. He's eagerly desiring it. I have to say, Barry, stop eating all the food. Why? Because he wants it. He's going after it. There's something that, that in fact, the, the Greek word that is translated eagerly uh, desire is really quite simple. You'll get it quite easily. It's zelo, where we get our word zealous from. Okay, And zealous is a lot stronger than just desiring something. It means that I'm going after it. And we need to be zealous that God, Holy Spirit, would be seen and glorify Jesus in our lives. That's what it's about. So it's not about a gift. It's actually being zealous that God would be glorified in my life and that Holy Spirit would be seen. So when Paul's speaking to these people, they definitely not apostles, by the way, but there are definitely gifts in this church. And he's coming and he's saying, you need to desire these things even more. And so when he puts fruit and, and uh, gifts together, the first thing that I want to remind you, we've got, a, we've got a series of sermons. You can go back and listen to them on the fruit of the Spirit. It, it's there. Please go and listen to it. Um, I think it was a sub-series in a series. You, you, you'll find it. But, but fruit is something that, that, that grows, isn't it? And we know it's something that grows in our lives. Um, and... and I used the illustration of a tree. Oh, there the, no scriptures coming up. I've got to read them all this morning. Okay, I gave you the illustration of a tree. And that, that trees grow, fruit trees grow, and one day they can produce fruit. And we said it's like growing in the love of God and our characters grow in Christ-likeness. And, and growth doesn't come overnight. It comes from careful nurturing. Have you ever seen a fruit tree, a little a seedling, orange, let's say an orange tree, what would happen if it produced a great big fruit? It'll break the tree. It'll damage the tree. So it doesn't. The tree grows and it grows and it grows, and then one day it starts sprouting flowers, and then it starts having a couple of fruit on it, and everybody gets all excited, and that's about four years later. Growth takes time. Growth takes effort. And, and a, a second sub-series you can go back and look at. Peter says, but also for this very reason, give all diligence to add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness agape love. He's saying you have to build your faith. It doesn't come automatically. You're the one who's growing it. You're saying I'm growing from faith into love. Remember we did that, that and remember Faith into love. You'll remember my hand signals. Um, so that your, 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 your knowledge of Jesus isn't wasted. That's a, a self-denying action, if you remember. If you want to grow from faith to love, you've got to get rid of a whole lot of your own stuff 
so that you can actually love people for who they are, for what they need. And as that grows and becomes mature, we begin to produce the fruit of love. People begin to see that we are loving in a way that is not natural. We're loving in a way that is Holy Spirit. It's agape love. It's not, I love ice cream. It's the love that says, I go to a cross because I love you. That's the love. It's sacrificial love. And Scripture teaches us quite clearly that we are babies and that we are born into this walk and we, we need to digest the Word and walk in the Spirit in order for us to be able to grow. And so growing in, in, in fruit is growing in, in maturity. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. You're not allowed to put your hands up because I know lots of you know the answer. If you've been in church a long time, all right, just get the answer in your head. How do you measure maturity? That's where we're all going. We all want to be that mature tree. I know you've got to put manure on the mature tree, but how do you measure it? How do you know when things are moving in terms of I've become a mature Christian? Well, it's not because you've got a name on the chair. It's not because you've attended enough Bible studies. It's not because you sing in the choir. It's not because, and I can go through all of them. How do you measure maturity? Well, we've got to go back to the Bible. And listen to the Hebrews. Though by this time you ought to be teachers. So you've been Christians for so long that you should by now be teachers. But you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracle of God. Hey guys, you've missed it. You've got to go back to the beginning. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. So it says something like this. By this time, you ought to be skilled in the word of God. You ought, you, the, the word of God ought to be something that, that, that you know, that you apply, and that you walk in. But solid food belongs to those who are mature. That is, those by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern between good and evil. Christian, you need to be exercising discernment on such a level that you can discern you guys are going to be good, all right? All good. Sorry, all evil, all right? You ought to be able to walk in and say, good, by the discernment of the Spirit. What is that? That's a manifestation of the Spirit. So how do I become mature when I'm, I'm skilled in the Word of God and I'm walking in discernment? That's Scripture. When I can walk into a room and the Holy Spirit can say to me, Rob, look at that. Whatever that happens to be. And we discern it. And in fact, we get told very clearly in John that, that beloved, do not believe every spirit. Now, we've just been told, we have learned how to discern between good and evil spirits. Because that's what discernment is. So yes, I have the word, but I need to know what's going on in the spirit realm. Hello? This is, our God is spirit. I, I should know when God is work. No, God isn't working there. When God is working. I should know the presence of Holy Spirit when we're worshiping. But I should know Halloween spirit. Hello? You should be able to walk into that shop and say, Lord, what was that? All right? That's discernment. And I should know what that is. Do you remember there was a day when, when Jesus was, was uh, in the synagogue and there was some guy in the, in the church, by the way. They remember, the synagogue is us. He's in the, the synagogue and there's a guy with an unclean spirit. Now, can we see unclean spirits with our eyes? No. We can't. Sometimes we can see the manifestation. 
station or the evidence of an unclean spirit in someone. But generally, you know, we, we don't have spiritual eyes that go, no, we have God, Holy Spirit living inside of us who can see every spirit. Hello? He doesn't miss anything, and you're in communion with him. So this man with the unclean spirit shouts at Jesus, leave us alone. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us before our time? We know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. And Jesus replies and says, I'll, I'll give it to you in Rob language. Shut up and get out. Now he said, be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him, he cried out with a loud voice and he came out. I want you to get something. This man was in church and nobody knew the spirit was there. And when he manifested, his mouth spoke. It was the man's mouth speaking to Jesus. And everybody would have looked at him and said, what's wrong with this nutter? And Jesus looked and he said, I see the unclean spirit. And yay, what your goed and trek. You see, mature Christians are those who have trained themselves through continual practice, continual practice of listening to the Spirit as He manifests those spirits around you, as He reveals them, as you discern them. He comes and He says, look at that. And each time you look at it, you say, Lord, I don't know what that is. What is that? And He reveals it to you. And it happens again, and He reveals it to you. And by the way, we're discerning spirits here, not people. And you'll see that when we do the discernment of spirits, we'll have people standing on tables and you'll get to see that. But you're discerning spirits. And if you know when the Holy Spirit is busy working in the church, you should also know when an unholy spirit is working in church. Why? Because we train ourselves by practicing what the Holy Spirit reveals to us. That's how we grow in maturity. And so we come along and we, we, we plonk ourselves in the church today and we say, okay, uh, Lord, I've been here for 15 years. No, I've been here for longer, sorry. I've been here for nearly 27 years. And I don't even know who's in the church. I don't even know when you are here, God. I just know when the, you know, the musicians sing my favorite songs. You, you have that? And then, and then some Sundays they just don't sing my songs. Hmm? Was God there? I don't know. No discernment. I'm not mature. So maturity comes with, with both us being in that space of growing spiritually, growing the tree, being equipped in the word, adding to ourselves, but it also comes with us learning to discern, which is a manifestation of the Spirit. So gifts and, uh, of the Spirit are kind of like the the fruit on a tree. Sorry. Fruits of the Spirit. Gifts of the Spirit are quite different. They're kind of like a Christmas tree. They're put underneath the tree. They don't belong to the tree. They belong to the Holy Spirit. It's not my fruit, my gift that I'm developing. It's, that's exactly what it is. It's something that is given to me that I didn't deserve. The tree didn't produce it. It's not a natural product of Rob. If it is, then I get the glory. No, it's a gift. It's like I walk up to the Christmas tree and there's a present underneath and I open it and I get it and I can use it. It's not mine. The moment I want to own it, I'm actually saying, well, this is my gift, <laughs> and watch me, and I can turn this on and off. I can't. It's impossible. It's a manifestation of the Spirit who lives inside of me. It's a manifestation of the Spirit who lives inside of you. And He wants, 
he wants people to see that it's not you, but that it's him. And remember, these are, I'm going to say this to you, these are wow moments, both for you and the other person. Right? A gift is a, wow, how did you know I wanted that? Right? So, Barry, you're my son again, and, and he really wanted a bicycle, no? so I gave him a scooter, and he went, wow, thanks, Dad. No? No? He's my son, and he goes, and he, he gets this little note that says, Barry, your presence outside, and it's a Harley Davidson. He goes, wow, thank you. That's what a, a gift is about. It's a wow moment. It's the moment that the Holy Spirit comes with that. I told you about that first word of knowledge that I had, just sitting with people, and it's suddenly there. I didn't think of it. It was there. I didn't ask for it. It was there. It was just dropped in. And that's what gifts are like. Remember, he's living inside of you. It's, it's just him in a moment saying, look over there, say that, do that. It's a momentary thing. And we've got to, we, we've got to get it that it's, it's in that moment, if you don't use it, you lose it. I, I, one of, one of the, 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 the words of wisdom that the Lord gave me I walked out of this building one day and I looked at the house over the road and I heard the Holy Spirit say, buy it. Buy it. Now, I could have said, well, I'm going to think about this and I'm going to pray about it and I'm going to get 10 estate agents to give me opinions on prices and what." And someone else might have bought it. And said, well, I didn't hear God. No, you weren't obedient. It's an in-the-moment thing. It's now. You can get a prophetic word for someone and, and God wants to encourage them in the moment and you don't give it. And then three years later, you say, you know, when you were going through those troubles, I had a prophetic word for you. Not helpful. Not helpful. Please, come on. It's now. It's, a, it's an instantaneous present. Take healing, for instance. We all can pray for healing. We're all commanded to pray for healing. There's not a single person here who can't pray for healing. But every now and again, God just drops something. It's a now moment, and the person gets healed. And you know what? If you spoke to the person who prayed for them, they'd say, I don't know how that happened. Why? It's a, it's a Holy Spirit moment. We can't then say, whoa, you know, we, we, we're going to write a book on this one, and this is the way we pray. You have to say these words. You know, when we get to these words, we, we, that's kind of like witchcraft, getting magic words. There are no magic words. It's just Holy Spirit drops it into your spirit in that moment, and it's done. It's over. I, I've, I've told you of, of the, the, the moment that I was praying for my nephew who, who was, had brain damage that they'd said he would be in a home forever. And in a moment, God showed me his brain being healed. I could see like I'm looking at you today. He's never done it again. I mean, I, I try to conjure it up the next time I prayed for someone. Let me see where that is. No. Because it wasn't me. It was a manifestation of the Holy Spirit touching and healing him completely. So we, we come along and we have to realize that, that, that these manifestations can't be replicated because they're not us. You can only be obedient and step into. And each time the Holy Spirit speaks to you, be obedient and continuously train yourself in obedience. Now, there's some people who, who walk in certain manifestations easier than others. Why? Because they just keep on walking, keep on walking, keep on obeying, keep on expecting, keep on eagerly desiring. God, will you keep on giving me this so that, listen, I can encourage the body? So that I can encourage the body. And then people say, okay, well, maybe, maybe that's your gift. No, it's Holy Spirit. It's never me. It's never you when it comes to a gift. So has the Holy Spirit dropped something in your spirit lately? Okay. Has, 
uh, remember, you, you took communion this morning. He lives inside of you. He's not silent. He's God. He's not scared to speak to you. Did any of you get a wobbly over the whole Halloween period? It'd be a good thing to get. This is your side, guys. Um, you get a wobbly. Hey, Lord, I, there's something wrong going on here. If you didn't, Lord, why didn't I? Why didn't I? Why, 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 why am I battling with this? And so maturity comes when I'm, I'm constantly allowing the Holy Spirit to drop things, and I pick them up quickly. He drops something, and I pick it up quickly. And so the relationship between fruit and gifts um, is measured in, in, in growth in Christ-likeness, because Jesus picked it up quickly. He just said, shut up and get out. And then I need to remind you this, that gifts are for the building up and the encouragement of others. Sometimes we don't even know what we're saying. We're just repeating what Holy Spirit has put in our minds. And I've told you about Herod's word of knowledge, which, which I, I, I will never forget in my whole life. Him and I are sitting in this room doing a deliverance with a lady, and we're going around in circles, round in circles, round in circles. And you know when you're going around in circles. You kind of know that. You know, um, and just because I have one leg, I don't walk around the same circle all the time. In fact, I've got to tell you, when Andrew announced that they needed some angels up in the front, I was quite hurt because they've got to have two left legs. Otherwise, you don't make it. So anyway, I won't be up there on the 17th. But, but we're sitting and, and, and we're going around and, and eventually Herod stops and, and in his broad Afrikaans accent looks at this lady and says, Lady, there's death in your handbag. Okay, I, I want you to get that. Does that make any sense to anyone? No one. I went... And she began to cry, and she opened the handbag, and she took out a receipt for an abortion 10 years earlier. Only made sense to her. But he was obedient to say what the Holy Spirit had put in his, in his heart. He was obedient to speak that out. And it wasn't for him. It was for her. And sometimes we are so worried about ourselves. Oh, what if I get this wrong? What if I say that wrong? What if I get that wrong? You know the voice of the Spirit. Do you really think that God wants to con you, fool you, embarrass you? No. No, not, not our God. So when he speaks a word, the only place that it's getting wobbly is with me. That, that I'm worried that somehow... I'm going to be manifested as a fool. So we need to be in that place where we say, Lord, I come. Now let's go back to our Corinthian letter. And uh, we've got to ask ourselves, is this for you today? Is this for me today? It, 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 has it passed on? Does your theology say that's all very well for you, Rob, because you're a pastor? But it's not for me. Paul says, when you come together, and we're coming together today, and you come together in cell groups, and you come together in prayer meetings, and you come together in various times, worship times, when you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things done be done for edification, for the building up. Right? Now notice this, each of you has these. Why? Each of you has the Holy Spirit in you. So praise God for, for Reino coming and leading us in a song this morning. Thank you, Lord. We were blessed, right? And hopefully, thank you, Lord, that Rob can teach. Thank you, Lord, that we may get a prophetic word. Thank you, Lord, that someone may be healed today. Let all things be done for edification. If, if anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two, at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. 
But if there's no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to, uh, let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who's sitting by, let the first keep silent. Well, you can all prophesy one by one that you may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Now he comes along and, and he says, you guys are already manifesting this in your church. But you, you're a little bit out of order. We need to make sure there's order in all of this. And so he, he, here he's just speaking about the, 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 the kind of things we would see in church, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and, and, and prophecy. But I want you to hear what he says to them in chapter 3. He says, And I, brethren, could, speak to you as, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as carnal, as babes in Christ. So just stop here. Right in the beginning of the, the, the letter, he says, You oaks are immature. That's really what he's saying. You're not the most mature bunch. You, I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you were unable to receive it. And even now, you're not able. For you're still carnal. For there's envy, strife, division among you. And, and, and he goes on. So the picture is, right in the beginning, Paul says, you guys are not mature. But when we get to chapters 12, 13, and 14, he comes and he says, but you are all speaking in tongues, you're all to seek prophecy, you're all to operate in order. What does that tell me? It tells me that spiritual gifts, manifestations, are not according to your maturity. Now there's the one that's going to get a bit of a wobbly and up some people's nostrils. It's according to the Spirit. It's according to the Spirit. So God can, Holy Spirit can use to use a, bra a brand new Christian who's obedient. A brand new Christian. Why? Holy Spirit is living inside of them. If he gives them a word of knowledge and they speak that word of knowledge, it is a manifestation of the Spirit. Now that's a, that really gets a little bit wobbly because what happens when we have somebody pray for the sick, they get healed, and then they don't have the character to go with it? Problems. Problems. Because we've been taught that this is how it works. There's an order. There's a structure. And when you get to here, you'll get a badge. Hmm? So if you've washed enough cups in the church, you can now become a door steward. Hmm. And when you've been a door stupid for a while, stupid for a while. <laughs> you know, th then you can work wherever. Maybe, ma oh, you can get a promotion to picking up all the communion glasses after the service. That's how we think. That's not how scripture teaches. That's why I said to you, you need to stop this morning and understand God, Holy Spirit, lives inside of you. He wants to be seen. He wants God, uh, Jesus to be glorified. He wants to be manifested. He's not worried about wh wh where and what and how you think you fit into the church. He says, I'm here. I want the world to see me. I want the church to be encouraged. Eagerly desire this. Eagerly desire this. Otherwise, what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to start having this, this list of, okay, well, can we have someone right in the back? Who's right in the back that I can see? Oh, I can see Miranda right in the back, hiding in the back corner. Hello, Miranda. Miranda, you're not allowed to come to the front until you've served 35 cups of coffee. All right. Five prayer meetings and three Hail Marys and a flick flack. Then you can come. No. Doesn't work like that. If God, Holy Spirit, is living inside of you and communing with you, and He wants to give, use you to wow somebody else, remember, He's going to use you to wow somebody else. You just have to be obedient. 
And one of the greatest problems that we find is, is, is that many, many, many Christians are waiting until they are ready. I don't know what ready looks like. But they're waiting until they're ready. And when they're ready, they'll say, okay, God, now I'm willing to pray for the sick. Okay, God, now I'm willing to give that word of knowledge. Okay, God, now I'm ready. No. You were ready the moment you were born again. Why do you think Paul has to speak to the Corinthians and it's a chamos? Because they, they, they babes in Christ and he's just giving them instruction. But he doesn't say none of you ought to be doing this. He doesn't say you're not qualified for this. He just says you're making a mess. Why do we get to the space where I have to preach like this? Well, I'm going to tell you. Because we haven't taken certain scriptures very seriously. And this is one, and I'm going to read you the scripture because I now know they're not coming up behind me. I'm going to read you the whole scripture. And... and, uh, the, the evening service are going to preach through this as a series in January, February, March, I think. Um, but it's Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 11. And, and I want you to listen carefully to what is being said. And he gave some, this he being Jesus, all right? Jesus gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers for the equipping of the saints for the works of ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all reach the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to the perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I'm going to stop there a moment. So Jesus comes and he says to the church, I'm going to give you these five, let's call them gifts to the church. And what is the purpose? Remember, we've got to look at purpose. What is the purpose? Well, that the whole church would be filled with the fullness of Christ. That the church would become Christ-like. You know what the word Christian means? Where it comes from? Little Christs. Little Christs. You would be the image of Jesus. So Jesus comes and says, You can't do that on your own. You're going to need these five ministries in your church. Call them whatever you want to. Why? And I'm going to jump down. He says, For the whole body, joined and knitted together by whatever joint supplies according to the effect of working, which is as every part does its share, causing growth of the body for the edification of of itself in love. So as you do your part, you edify, you build up the rest of the body. And we're going to end up building each other up in love. And then you'll remember what Paul says, do all prophesy? No. Do all speak in tongues? No. But when you do what you are supposed to do, this body gets built up in love. That's the pattern that Jesus established. In most churches, and I'm speaking about Baptist churches, I'm not speaking about other churches. In most churches, you either have a pastor or a teacher. That's it. We we, we either have a church where, oh, we love our pastor, or we say, oh, he's such a good teacher, or she is really caring, and he really knows the Bible. Seldom do we have a church where we have pastors and teachers. Why? They have a different function according to Jesus. Seldom do we have churches where we have pastors, teachers, prophets, evangelists. We want to keep them away. He's sitting down now. But you know, they want to be outside there anyway. But evangelists and apostles. Seldom do we have apostles, real apostles, coming and speaking the truth of the kingdom in the church. Which means that seldom are we equipped. 
Because you see, Jesus said these are giving for the equipping of the saints. And that word is like a military equipping. This is, this is to get you ready for war. And by the way, we live in a kingdom of light and we attack darkness. We invade the darkness. The darkness doesn't invade us. And if you cannot even discern what's in the darkness, you're in trouble. And so Jesus comes and he says, we, we've, these are appointed. And for many of us, we grew up with a pastor. Or we grew up with a teacher. But the rest was neglected. Because it wasn't important. In fact, I heard a very popular preacher teacher this week, and I don't know how he ended up on my feed, um, but he did. And he read the scripture that I've just read for you. And when he'd finished reading it, he, he ended it with this. I believe that we have evangelists, pastors, and teachers today. What has he just said? I don't believe that we have prophets and apostles today. He didn't say it like that. Because you can't say it like that. Because that goes against Scripture. It goes against the Scripture. You can't say we're going to have pastors in our churches, but <laughs> we don't need apostles. Most churches kind of feel like we don't need evangelists. No. Jesus said if you are going to be equipped, if you are going to be equipped, if we're going to be equipped to do the works of service, to become Christ-like, if we're going to be equipped to become mature in the faith, we need all, all five of them in imparting into our lives. How will we hear the voice of God if we don't have the prophetic voice to teach us? How will we ever see miracles, signs, and wonders if we refuse to have an apostle in the church? So what, same Corinthians. Truly the sign of an apostle are accomplished amongst you uh, in all perseverance, in signs, in wonders, in mighty deeds. Why do you think we don't see signs and wonders and mighty deeds in the church today? Do you think the Holy Spirit went on holiday? No, because we said we don't need those people in our church. You can keep them. So we need to be in a church where all of these are involved, and we need to be able to say, I need to be trained, I need to be equipped to be able to walk in these things, these gifts that the Holy Spirit is giving us. And then there's the question of, well, if I, as long as I just have a Christ-like character, do I need to do that stuff? You know, do we really need the supernatural stuff when we've got the Bible? Yes, we do. And I'm going to give you an illustration, and you're not allowed to question my mother afterwards. So, true story. I was 12, and I wasn't a bright child. So, there, if I could get out of school, I would. But it was exam time. And I came home from school, and I told my mother I was sick. And my mother said, oh, my boy, I'm so sorry. Why don't you have a cup of tea? And maybe lie down. So I had a cup of tea, and I lay down, and I was still feeling sick. And I got up, walked to my mother. I said, I think I'm running a temperature. And she stroked my hair like, you know, moms do to their kids. She said, you'll be all right, my boy. Come, you just lie down. And then I started shivering. And she said, you need a blanket. And she put a blanket on me. I said, I'm feeling really sick, mom. You've got to do something about this. She said, I tell you what. You just need something to eat. Good mother, you know. Not an Omar biscuit, but anyway, I ate something. And then what I ate came out. And she said, oh, maybe there's something wrong with you. <laughs> so she, she got the thermometer and she put it in my mouth. And she took it out of my mouth and she looked at it and said, oh, this thing must be broken. It says you have a temperature of 104. Maybe I didn't flick it enough. So she flicked it again, and she stuck it in my mouth, and she said, no, it's definitely broken because it's saying 104 again. So she phoned my gran, who lived on the farm next door, and she said, 
I think my thermometer's broken. I'm going to bring Robert to, t- to check it. And she put me in the car, and she loved me and she, everything. And she drove to my gran, and I didn't feel like getting out of the car because I was feeling a bit weak. And my gran came and loved me a little bit because that's what grands do. And she put the thermometer in my mouth, and it was 104. So the two of them decided I might be sick. <laughs> so my, my mother goes and she phones the doctor, the same doctor who delivered me into the world, and she says, is it possible for Robert to have a temperature of 104? He says, if it's 104, you better drive to the hospital and I'll meet you there. So we drive to the hospital. Now my mom's feeling a little guilty, so, so I'm getting extra love. You know that we're, I'm getting the extra love and, and go in and uh, the doctor walks in and knows me well, knows everybody well enough. And the first thing he says is, where have you been in the last two weeks? My mother says, oh, we've been here. He's got malaria. So he rolled me over and gave me a quinine injection, which if you've had one, you never forget in your entire life. All right, I got my quinine injection, and then I lost three days. All right, did my mother love me? Yes. But that level of love was never going to help me. I needed more than just being loved and pampered and, and cared for. I needed something miraculously powerful. Do we need to love each other? Yes. But sometimes we need a word of knowledge. Sometimes we need a prophetic word. Sometimes we need a breakthrough something that's going to break through, that's going to bring life. You can pat and and nurture and love a child until they die of of malaria, because they will. Or you can say, there's got to be something else. And we've got to have something else. And I'm going to say to you today, as as a a church, we can't say, should we have fruit without gifts? Because it's like giving all the love and the care and being nice to each other without the power. And this morning, I, I, I want to challenge you. For many of us have had a word that has come in power that has touched and changed our lives. A word in season, when someone has spoken it, it's been a turnaround in our lives. Why? Because that manifestation was the the wow that we needed in the moment. And by the way, often we don't even remember who gave us the wow. We remember it was God. We remember the Lord said, the Lord did this, the Lord did that. So if you're here this morning and you're saying, I'm not so sure... I'm not so sure that I really believe in these things. Then I'm going to say to you, go back to Scripture. Go back to Scripture and say, Lord, if I'm to eagerly desire this, if I'm to to manifest you in the world, then forgive me for, for not being willing to do it. Forgive me for being embarrassed. Forgive me for being... Afraid, forgive me for wondering what people will think or say to me. But you, Holy Spirit, live inside of me. And I trust that the word of God is true. That I don't just need fruit. I don't just need to be that 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 I gotta be Christ-like, but I need to hear what you're saying. Why? Because you want to touch the world through me. You want to touch the world through me. This is selfish when I say, I refuse to manifest these gifts. It's selfish. It's my pride getting in the way. And it's me saying, oh, well, what happens if something doesn't work out? I remind you of, lady, there's death in your handbag. She was delivered. She was set free from guilt and shame that she'd walked around with for 10 years. Delivered by the Lord. Because the Holy Spirit wanted her free. He wants to use you. You say, I'm not mature. No excuse. 
You say, I don't know if it's my theology. Study your Bible. Get it right. But don't walk out of here today saying, well, you know, I don't think that's for me. Because we started off this morning by saying, Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And he wants, to, he wants to be seen. He wants Jesus glorified. And he wants, he wants you to be an instrument in his hand. To be able to touch, to build up, to nurture, to encourage those around you. Take a risk. The Corinthians took a risk. They had a mess. It was fine. Could get sorted out. It's easier to sort out messes than to try and get people to do something they don't want to. So my challenge, my challenge to you today is, what was the last thing the Holy Spirit dropped into your spirit? Because he's there. What was the last thing he just dropped into your spirit? It might have been wild. It normally is, by the way. And it does normally require a miracle. And he's normally planning to do one. Is there a desire for more of that? Is there a desire to hear the Holy Spirit more intimately, more clearly? Is there a desire to grow in maturity by practicing that time and time and time again? Is there a zeal inside of you that says, I want Jesus glorified. I want to see the body grow. If there is, step out. Step out. If there's not, I'm going to pray for you this morning. Because that's not your portion. Your portion is to have that, that desire that, that delight in stepping out and, and seeing the Holy Spirit touch people and wow people. And that they say, whoa, God, you were just in the room. So, Father, we just want to thank you. We want to thank you that doubt is not a reason to stand before you. Thank you that you remove all doubt from our minds because your word is clear. Thank you that your word is never changes. It will never change. Thank you that your word is true. Thank you that your word instructs. Thank you that we can be skilled in the word of truth. So we want to pray, Holy Spirit, this morning, that you wake up the desire inside of us. You stir up the desire inside of us to glorify Jesus. Extend our faith. You say, as small as a mustard seed. As small as a mustard seed. Thank you that we have more than a mustard seed. We have you, God, living inside of us. And now we want to ask, reveal yourself to us, Holy Spirit. Speak to us. Lead us. Guide us for the glory of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. For the building up of the body of Christ. And then we pray one last thing. Lord, and I ask Raina to come up. Lord, thank you for every person who is bold enough to speak a word of knowledge to us. Thank you for every person who spoke a word of encouragement to us. Thank you for every person that spoke a prophetic word to us. We honor their faith. We honor their obedience. And we pray today, bless them, Lord. May they walk in the blessing of hearing your voice absolutely clearly. 
And may they know you intimately in this day. Thank you for those who have gone ahead of us. Thank you for those who have taught us. Thank you for those who you've put in our path to teach us. Bless them, please, Lord. May they continue to do what you've called them to do. And then for us, Father, raise up wow Christians. Raise up a body that encourages one another, that builds one another up, that loves one another so that you can be glorified right here in Melkos. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you'd like to stand up, we'll sing together. We fall down We lay our crowns At the feet Of Jesus Greatness of His mercy and love is at the feet of Jesus. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy. of every day. You walk with us. You, you guide us. You speak to us. Thank you for the joy of knowing that it's not just for us, but it's for a lost world. It's for a church. It's for brothers and sisters. Give us the grace and the boldness and the desire, the eagerness to be able to glorify you in this week, even as we walk out of this building, even as we go into our our Sunday lunches and everything else that we're doing. May we hear you clearly and give us the faith to speak your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And if you'd like to be prayed for this morning, there'll be teams who will pray for healing as well as anything else that you might need prayer for. You're welcome to come to the front. <laughs>